these rare occasions where there is an, an abrupt radical recognition of our essential nature, the reason, uh, in fact the only reason why it is difficult to integrate this recognition in our everyday experience is for uh, lack of proper guidance. There is absolutely nothing uh, that is incompatible about the recognition of our essential being and leading a, a fully functional relational life. If it seems that there is an incompatibility between these two, the recognition of our essential nature and leading a, a fully integrated life, it, it is simply because we have uh, not yet explored or had the help in exploring how these two fit together. The recognition of our true nature is so often described in the literature as some marvelous, exotic, extraordinary experience that happens to one in a million enlightened people. The recognition of our true nature is simply the recognition of what we refer to when we say, I am. Each of us, all day long, we are making statements about ourselves. I am tired. I am hungry. I am lonely. I am married. I am 34 years old. I am sick, etc., etc., etc. In each of these cases, there is a basic I am that is subsequently qualified by various feelings, activities, states, relationships, etc. All that is necessary is to see the nature of that to which we refer when we say, I am, before it has been qualified or conditioned by experience. There is nothing extraordinary or exotic about that recognition. In fact, even the taste of tea is exotic compared to the knowing of our own being. The knowing of our own being is the simplest, the most obvious, the most intimate experience there is. And no one has privileged access to it. <laughs> the reason why some people seem to see or know more clearly than others their true nature is that they have not allowed their essential being to be colored and therefore obscured by experience. In other words, when most people feel, I am depressed, the I am part of the experience is obscured by the depression. The depression is what we experience. But some people, even in the midst of an intensely unpleasant experience, such as depression, they emphasize the I am aspect of the experience, not the depressed aspect. Even in a deep depression, even in the experience, I am depressed, the I am that I am shines brightly. It is not even necessary to turn away from the depression, to exchange it for a more positive emotion. All that is necessary is just to discern the I am that is shining, that is present behind the experience, but also shining in the experience. So the more deeply we go into that experience, when I say the more deeply we go into it, I don't mean to suggest that we are one thing, 
And the experience of our essential being is another thing. It's just a limitation of language. The more deeply our being r- remains with itself, stays in itself, sinks into itself, the more clearly its qualities, if we can call them qualities, they are really the absence of qualities. But the absence of disturbance we call peace. The absence of the sense of lack we call happiness. So if I ascribe positive qualities to our essential being, please understand that what I am really describing is the absence of all the qualities that we usually attach to experience. Our essential being is free of all disturbance, and hence its nature is peace. It is free of the sense of lack, and hence its nature. So that may not seem to be a very direct answer to your question. But what I intend by this answer is to make it very clear to you that your recognition of your essential nature is not an extraordinary experience that happened 14 years ago. It is just a very simple, intimate, ever-present recognition of the essential, uncolored being prior to its coloring or conditioning by thought, feeling, activity, and relationship. And the recognition of that should not make your life any more difficult to lead. On the contrary, it should make your life easier. Your activities are no longer um, filtered through the neurotic fears and desires of a temporary finite self. Your relationships are no longer at the mercy of a separate self who is always seeking to fulfill itself through the acquisition of an object, an other a state of mind. So this simple recognition, uh, our essential being's recognition of itself in us, gradually clears up the way we think and feel, and subsequently the way we act and relate. (coughs) If the recognition of the self is is not an experience, you're right. The recognition of the self, its recognition of itself, is not an experience it is only possible to experience something that is at an apparent distance from ourselves. For instance, it is only possible for the eyes to see something that is at a distance from them. Likewise, it is only possible to know something as as an object that it is at a distance from the knower. Now, there is no distance from ourself to ourself. And therefore, ourself cannot know itself as an object of experience. You can know the sound of my voice now, or the sight of this room, as an object of experience, because there seems to be one thing called you, the knower, and another thing called me, the speaker, or the room. But You, the knower, can never be an object of your own knowledge because you are already too close to yourself to be able to know yourself as an object. The sun that illuminates is the sun that is illuminated. There is no distance from the sun to the sun and therefore it cannot illuminate itself as an object in the same way that it can illuminate the moon. Likewise, our self cannot know itself as an object of experience because it is too close to itself to be able to separate itself from itself and turn around and say, ah, there is myself as an object. (coughs) In other words, the self's knowledge 
of itself. Consciousness is knowledge of itself, is the only knowledge there is that does not take place in subject-object relationship. And it is as such an utterly unique knowledge that is different from and prior to any other knowledge or experience. In fact, it is the only knowledge that is not relative to the finite mind. And it is thus called absolute knowledge. It is the only absolute knowledge there is. That is the only knowledge there is that is not relative to or dependent upon the finite mind. It is in a different category of knowledge altogether. And it is thus called the absolute or the absolute truth. Our knowledge of ourself, the knowledge that shines in each of us as the experience I am, is consciousness is knowledge of itself. And I would suggest in religious language is God's knowledge of himself in us. In other words, I would suggest that the, the simple experience that each of us has, the knowledge I am, before the I am is colored or conditioned by experience, is God's presence shining in each of our hearts. But that presence cannot be known by anything other than itself. It, just as the sun illuminates itself, so the self knows itself directly, not through subject-object relationship. As the 13th century Sufi mystic Balayani said, no one sees him except, please, please don't um, object to the use of the pronoun he. That was just the literary convention in 13th century Persia. No one sees him except himself. No one reaches him except himself. No one knows him except himself. He knows himself by himself. He reaches himself through himself alone. Only he knows him. On another occasion, Banayani again describing this same the same understanding that the self is known by itself alone. He said, um, he sent himself from himself, through himself, to himself. There is no intermediary or means other than him. There is no difference or distance between the sender, that which is sent, and the one to whom it is sent. So you are absolutely right. Our essential being, pure consciousness, cannot be known by the mind as an object of experience. But this does not mean that it doesn't know itself. It knows itself before it knows any other thing. And its knowledge of itself shines in our experience as the simple knowledge I am. 